come with me. No! Fight! Perfect! Hello and welcome to part 2 of this review of Boss Fight Studios' Vitruvian Hacks figures, looking this time at Series 1 Wave 6. I'm Chris McLeod aka Diagnostic80 and I'll be weasel beaning my way through the next few videos to show you these incredible products by Boss Fight Studio. I've already covered a lot of the history of some of these characters in older video reviews with Justin Bell at General's Joes, I'll add a link to the playlist for those videos underneath this one. Let's go through these one by one, starting with the beautiful EOS Warrior. Fight! Perfect! Ok, to understand the Eos warrior we must first understand Eos. In Greek mythology Eos was the goddess of the dawn and had a brother and a sister, Helios and Selene. We will be looking at Helios in the next video for the Helios warrior, obviously. Eos is often described as being very beautiful, with wings of a bird and having rosy fingers or rosy forearms. I can't even begin to count the times I've been referred to as old rosy forearms over there. It might have been rosy foreskin actually. She was the daughter of Hyperion and Thea and was cursed by Aphrodite for knocking sandals with Ares. The curse gave Eos an insatiable appetite for sex, which led her to abducting a number of young men. Yeah, I know, isn't Greek mythology great? Some of the most notable lucky bastards were Cephalus, hope she didn't catch anything, Cletus, a slack-jawed yokel who was made immortal by her, Some vocal memories good, but then again some vocal, like Cletus, the slack-jawed yokel. Hey, what's going on on this side? And Titonus, who was also made immortal, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth, which meant the poor guy lived forever as a helpless old man. Yikes. She had sons with Titonus named Memnon and Emathian. Memnon fought in the Trojan Wars but was slain, an image depicted on this attic red figure cup with Eos holding him as he slips away. Dark. I love what Boss Fight and Paddy Lennon have done with the Eos Warrior, effectively adding to an already rich history with Eos, she now has an army of warriors to command against the immensely dangerous Gorgon threat. I can't wait to see what Deco Cephalus gets, probably an angry red. Fight! Perfect! So, to the box. Amazing James Griffiths art as always, with package designed by Troy McKee, also as always, and an awesome backstory courtesy of Paddy Lennon, as, as always. She comes with a trusty figure stand and spare hands, as always, a cookery with a candy red handle and translucent yellow blade, I'll stop saying as always, a small sword and larger sword in the same colour scheme, red helmet with yellow plume, a beautiful red shield with the most magnificent phoenix emerging from the ashes tamper on it, two wrist gauntlets that were a pain to remove and did leave a little paint mark on the forearms, her bright red chest armour with another version of that gorgeous phoenix tampo on the front that can be removed by pulling the pegs out the back, a very striking fustanella that you can access by separating the figure at the midriff, I love the orange, yellow and red scheme on this piece as it really seems to bring out the details of the mould and it even has the loop on the back to hold a sword. Finally, she has two candy red shin guards that were easily the hardest things I've had to remove out of all the accessories in all of the hacks line ever. Wow, that thing was on there. It was so difficult to pull off <coughs> that it turned inside out. <coughs> Just be careful with that and take your time, it will come off eventually. And there she is in all her shiny orange Lucasade translucent glory. The thinner female buck shows off the innards a lot clearer than the male, but the reds and yellows in the plastic are so dramatic it doesn't matter. Something I hadn't realised before filming this was that she has no mouth on the head sculpt, which is pretty jarring at first, but it is a cool look with the plastic effect and works really well with these godlike magical creations. All geared up she looks fantastic and once again Boss Fight's Barcelona Away Kit Deco choices have blown me. <coughs> away. The plastic has a slightly different feel to that of the regular female buck and was loose in a few places, not loose enough to affect balance or posing surprisingly, but enough to be noticeable when holding her. Also, the helmet didn't fit as well as all the others, it's just slightly too big for the head. Overall though, striking and deadly, like my farts. Fight. Perfect. Next up we have one of my favourite boss fight figures of all time, the Berserker. In the vast depths of Greek mythology it is hard to find any examples of Gorgons with a largely male appearance, but you could argue that the Gorgon sister's father Phorces is exactly that. 
Not in a Gorgon appearance, of course, but a male blood relative of Medusa, Uriel, and Theno, and that's all I got for that. Snake Men isn't a new concept. If you follow Masters of the Universe in many of its iterations, then you will be aware of the Snake Men. Albeit the structure is the other way around with male legs and a snake's head, the Berserker isn't the only male with a snake's tail in popular culture, however. We have Globulus from the 1987 animated G.I. Joe movie, a character that many Joe fans have clamoured for in a modern release, and now they have an option to customise one themselves thanks to the Boss Fight crew. What Boss Fight and Paddy have done here is really cool. The story goes that Steno poisoned some of Urel's disciples at her request, turning them into a strange hybrid with two lots of different venom in their veins. The resulting product was that of a vicious warrior blinded by rage that is used as a siege weapon in battle to the danger of both sides. Once again this is beautifully executed and makes a ton of sense in this universe boss fight and friends are creating. On top of that, he looks incredible. Fight! Perfect! The card art shows his use of the toxin tip swords, just the tip, that is mentioned in the backstory. This guy is dangerous. He comes with spare hands and a figure stand, a cool black snake skull helmet with silver fangs, his two toxin tip swords and two black sheaths with straps. Not a massive complement of weapons and accessories, but he really doesn't need it. The base figure is just breathtaking. The deco is striking and very simple with the light and dark green tones really popping off each other. The jagged lines are a nice addition here, and the deco travels from the chin all the way down to the bottom of the tail. He has a cool design on his back with two white loops and stems that break up all that green. The inside of the hands are light green and the dark green goes over the back of the hands covering the middle two fingers. The head sculpt is gorgeous with the red eyes just burning into anybody he looks at. I can't get enough of this guy and we'll be ordering so many more of these. As always with these figures the articulation is fantastic and hugely versatile. As I said before he lends himself well to a Globulus custom and it just highlights how good this design is that it took this long to get right. The original Globulus is awesome but the tail doesn't really vibe with the much better articulation of the other figures in that line of the time. Anyway, he's great, enough said, moving on. Fight. Perfect. Sometimes there isn't a specific mythological reference for a character and that's fine. In a line this size you can absolutely experiment with different ideas and even play around with known snake colorations and a neat backstory. That's what we have with the Anacretus Gorgon. The deco is based on the Neon Garter Snake, not to be confused with the Neon Garter Belt, with that lovely Barcelona home kit colouring and the name Anacretus is Greek for interrogator, which is the main skill this particular character has in the canon. Using a mixture of torture and mesmerisation they can extract info from even the strongest willed, Jedis. They dance too apparently so they are the first strippers of the hacks line. Well they dance to extract information, sort of like my dream job. Fight. Perfect. I've really enjoyed the James Griffith card art on these figures and Anacretus Gorgon is no exception. Probably should have had a lap dancing though, but it's all good. We've already gone into that fabulous backstory, so to the accessories. Figure stand and two spare hands, standard. Two very cool electric blue guitar daggers that are slightly different. One is shorter and there are some subtle details that separate the weapons. The glorious Gorgon shield in this wonderful colour again, a grey snake skull helmet, grey body armour with the small black Gorgon crest on the front that can be removed like so. Two grey wrist gauntlets, you know the drill by now, remove the hand and shimmy them off. It left a touch of paint behind but again shouldn't be too hard to remove. There she is. I have been looking forward to this release ever since they revealed the character way back when. The colour scheme is just so cool and really attractive to me. In a similar way to the Berserker, the chin merges with the blue colour on the neck and decolletage. I love the black striping used to separate the red and the blue as well. Really reminiscent of the Neon Garter Snake. There's something about this paint job that just shouldn't work in theory, but once again is absolutely nailed by boss fight in reality. No need to get into the articulation again, the Gorgons are all the same. Wonderful snake body and superb upper torso, amazing stuff. I love the head sculpts on the Gorgons, and feel as though the closed and open mouth versions both have a place. I think a closed mouth would have suited the skill set of the Anacretus personally, but only to highlight the calm and methodical demeanour I would expect from a torture and interrogation specialist. The open mouth looks like they enjoy that far too much, but maybe they do. Fight. Perfect. To the Iliad now, the epic Greek poem written by Homer concerning the final days of the Trojan War and the main character, Achilles. His mother was Thetis, a sea nymph, and his father was Peleus, the king of the Myrmidons. 
In the Achilliad, another epic poem written after Homer's Iliad by Roman poet Statius, described the birth and death of Achilles, and it is in this writing that we first hear of Achilles' invulnerability, stating that Thetis attempted to make him invulnerable by dipping him in the river Styx, only to give him a weak spot where she was holding him by his heel. Should have done a re-dip. Back to the Iliad, and a number of things happen that create a rather rocky relationship between Achilles and the commander of the Greek forces in the Trojan Wars, Agamemnon. That's an understatement, but in brief, the war was waged against the city of Troy by the Achaeans after Paris of Troy took Helen, the wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta and the brother of Agamemnon. Achilles refused to fight when Agamemnon dishonoured him, and despite numerous attempts to get him back knowing how important he was in winning the war, Achilles only returned when his close friend Patroclus was killed by Hector. Patroclus wore Achilles' armour during the attack, and so new armour was made for the grieving Achilles, including the shield of Achilles, which is superbly recreated created by Boss Fight Studio. At this point, Achilles returns to battle, kills Hector, and then drags his lifeless body around the gates of Troy. Following that, and taking from numerous sources, Achilles killed Penthesilia despite falling for her beauty after her death, he killed Memnon before getting shot by an arrow by Paris in the heel, but also stabbed in the back in some stories, chasing Trojans into the city. The Trojan horse thing happened after Achilles' death, but the movie Troy switches that up to make that particular gambit the ploy in which Achilles was able to get inside the city and thus meet his end by the bow, and equally as important, the arrow of Paris. Obviously, this is where we get the Achilles tendon, and phrases like it was his Achilles heel when describing my love of biscuits or cookies if you're American. It shows the huge impact these myths and legends have had on popular culture, and one of the main reasons I love the Vitruvian Hacks line, and gives me an opportunity to relive my college years studying classical civilization, albeit very poorly. I perfect. Okay, that's the bite-sized history of Achilles over with, now to his action figure. Full disclosure, I was anticipating the release of this figure way before his reveal, and was so happy they decided to do the character. The overall look of the figure is great, but definitely not the route I expected them to follow. I think I've been tainted with the Brad Pitt as Achilles image, and that has distorted my view on what he should look like. Over the years, Achilles has been depicted with curly hair, short hair, long hair, hair under the helmet, a youthful face, a bearded face, and now Brad Pitt, so the aesthetic of the character is totally up for debate, and by creating their own version of the character, they have essentially infused him with that boss fight charm. There's always something about the James Griffiths card art that I've noticed, and this time it's the sly look Achilles is giving out of the corner of his eye. Really subtle, and I didn't see the eye until I got up close. There's a Tom Cruise look to the character here, that's Tom Cruise in Top Gun, not Tom Cruise in Magnolia. What Paddy has done with the story here is great, making him a hero in the Trojan War, but then also shifting his death at the hands of the Paris to Uriel stabbing him in the heel, causing him to be subservient to her demands. It gives him a brand new personality and dynamic with his lover Penthesilia. It's not like there's a rule book with Greek mythology, and that allows for some wiggle room in the backstory. Anyway, to his accessories. He has a spear with one gold tip, one silver tip, and a subtle brown handle. Figure stand and spare hands of course, a spare bald head sculpt, a spare right foot which will become clear later, two awesome silver and black axes, his gold handled sword, the shield of Achilles with all the detail in that tampo from the original, his gold helmet with black plume, black gold and brown sword sheath, the beautiful body armour in brown and gold, the details are stunning in this scheme and look fantastic. Finally, he has two pretty epic black and gold shin guards and a silver right foot to highlight his weakness and I'm guessing the consequence of being stabbed by Uriel. That leaves us with a naked Achilles. The standard issue male buck is as always solid, well articulated and very simple in this case due to the lack of tattoos, scars, birthmarks or poop smears. All geared up, he is so cool, and there are a number of different looks you can give him with the spare foot, head and tons of weapons and accessories. A character with a ton of history, and now a pretty sweet 4-inch fully articulated action figure. Right. Perfect. So it would appear that Boss Fight Studio have gone straight for my Achilles heel, if you will, with this Vitruvian Hacks line, and I'm so happy with that. I've been able to witness the growth of this independent toy company from their initial Kickstarter to where they are now. I consider them close friends, but that does not affect how I see their product. I wholeheartedly believe these are the best 4-inch action figures on the market, and I now can't wait for the following series, graphic novel, and numerous other products related to the line to be seen in the future. On top of all that, they have revealed the Bucky O'Hare franchise news, and will be dropping those figures very soon. Very exciting stuff. Right. Perfect. 
All of these amazing figures are available at Boss Fight's website, www.bossfightshop.com, so make sure you go there now and buy a ton of figures and gear. Thanks for watching this review, and be sure to catch me doing this again very soon in the final part for Wave 7. I have been Chris McLeod, and you have fired an arrow at my cankle. <laughs>